What I keep coming back to is safe and effective masking. Maximize it. You know, what can we get the most of? If you have a car that only has a single seat belt, wear it. But on the other hand, if you have a car that has a seat belt harness, collapsible air, uh, body, airbags, computer on system on board to slow you down before impact, shard glass that so doesn't cut you, get that. And the point is being able to describe optimal protection. So it's not about yes or no masking, it's about please, optimal masking. Don't wear it under your nose. It becomes just a diaper chin for your chin at that point, okay? And you know what? The governor of Florida has circulated widely within the state of Florida, my comment saying masks don't work, hmm. okay? Now it's exactly the point. You're gonna have people use against you some quote that's taken totally out of context and not put into the content as we want it as scientists, we have to learn to deal with that. And and it's hard, it's very hard. And I don't think as a science community, we're really taught how to deal with the issues like this, how to communicate. The last piece I would say is, you know, I've been in this business 46 years and I can tell you the last 19 months have been unlike any of the 46 years. I've been involved with many controversial issues. Uh, I led the effort in Minnesota to be the first state in the country to make HIV reportable at a time when it was seen as a potentially very discriminatory action, etc. Well, in the last 18 months, you, I wish you could see the number of death threats I've received or the number of vile emails and, and so forth I get every day. That is a whole new world that we in science now have to adjust to. And we have to be sure that we don't let that shape our messages, that we don't let that hmm. change telling the truth. But it's nonetheless a real challenge that is really a first time for me in all of my public health career. Good evening. I'm Susan Spurlock, Executive Director of Ford Hall Forum at Suffolk University, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this evening's program, Life After COVID-19, The New Normal. The final program in our six-week summer series, Politics in the Era of Global Pandemic 2.0. Now we'll turn the program over to my colleague, Christina Coolidge, a faculty member in Suffolk's Political Science and Legal Studies Department. Christina. Thank you, Susan, and welcome everyone to the final episode of our survey course for everyone. I'm really excited, as I always am, about tonight's panel, but this one is a little bit different. So we're gonna begin a little bit differently. We named this series, we're, we're kind of doing a redux of, of the course that we taught last year. And when we were beginning to prepare for it, like how, how do we reframe it? How are the materials updated? How do we think about where we are today as opposed to where we were last year when we were doing this series? So we called it 2.0. And honestly, we were still in that kind of hot vac summer mentality, a little bit more, a little bit more optimistic. That clearly is not the case. And I think that we're gonna hear a lot about that tonight. So we do have a time-lapse photo from Johns Hopkins, which will show you the progress of the positive cases from the beginning of the pandemic, which was a little bit before we started the series last year up until today. So this gives you an idea of what has happened between then and now, which is admittedly a little bit scary. The other thing that I'd say is that this isn't stopping. We often begin these episodes by putting up numbers of cases in the world, numbers of vaccinations delivered, and providing a reminder that we are still in the teeth of this pandemic globally, and with the rise of the Delta variant, absolutely at home, the hot vac summer idea is done. So we have another slide from the CDC, which tells you what case positive and community transition, transmission, excuse me, looks like today. I looked at this yesterday and there were more orange states, which are substantial rates of community transition. The rest of the United States 
is having high transmission rates of COVID and the predominant strain is the Delta variant. So if we look at that and ask sort of where we are and how do we get out of this, that's the crux of what we want our panelists to get at tonight. So I'm not an epidemiologist. I don't work in development. I don't work on vaccine distribution. I'm a political scientist. So I'm interested in the policy that's driving some of the choices that we've made, some of the missteps that we've made, and some recommendations about what it is that we can do to get to the new normal, whatever that is. So I'm gonna turn the panel over to the fabulous Eugene Daniels, who has very graciously joined us again tonight to moderate what is gonna be a great discussion. So take it away, Eugene. Thank you so much, Christina. What a depressing like chart situation to start off with you guys. <laughs> um, thank you guys, my name is Eugene. Um, something I've thought a lot about, I'm a, I'm a political reporter, um, and something that you have all thought about a, a lot about is what happens when all this hell is over, right? Like what happens when we're not, we don't have to be in Zoom when, you know, Delta is not running around. Um, so I'm very excited for this panel. Um, I wanna jump right in. First, I wanna introduce our panelists. Um, if I say your name wrong, please tell me because I've practiced, but you know, you never know. Um, Amish Adolja, did I get it? Amish Adolja. Amish. I told you I was going to right out the gate. Um, senior scholar, Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security. Rachel Silverman, I feel strongly that I got that one right. Policy fellow at the Center for Global Development. And Michael Ostrahom, director um, at the Center for Disease Research and Policy, as well as a professor in many divisions at the University of Minnesota. Um, thank you guys for being here. Rachel, I, I want to start with you um, with kind of some, I guess, some breaking news. President Biden ha spoke to the American people just a couple of hours ago. And the main thrust of what he talked about was the booster um, for Americans after eight months of the mRNA vaccines. Um, you look at kind of like the global aspect of um, this pandemic specifically, and there's been a question about why someone like me, young-ish, um, healthy, who's, who, who does have a vaccine, lives in America, has access to a lot more, um, why I would get a booster, why I would be allowed to get a booster when there are a lot of other countries who are at even 2% um, vaccination rate. So talk to me a little bit about how important the equity piece of this is to get us out of this and to get us to that new normal, to move us out of this pandemic. It's enormously important. So if we think about what we're going through now with the Delta variant, uh, the Delta variant originated in India, and it originated in a context of uncontrolled transmission that was due to the fact that the population was unprotected and very vulnerable. So as long as that's the case around the world, as long as you have uncontrolled transmission anywhere, you are going to get new variants that pop out. You are going to have the risk of you know, reimportation. It is not a sustainable exit from this crisis. And I think what we're also seeing is that, yes, there are breakthrough cases, but if you're looking at what's driving transmission on the whole in the US right now, it's not the people who have two vaccines. Yes, they are, it is possible for them to transmit, and the science is showing that, but it is not what is driving the epidemic as a whole. So, and we're continuing to see very high, uh, very high protection for, except for the most uh, elderly and vulnerable patients in people who have received that double vaccination. So I think population-wide boosters, it's an effort to, to do something that people would mm. accept because right now we're hitting the wall on getting new people vaccinated. People who have already been vaccinated are in some way an easier target, but it's not, the marginal impact of that is going to be very small. And it's myopic when you look at the global situation, when you think about both the sort of human cost of so many people around the world who are vulnerable, remaining completely unvaccinated and unprotected, and then also the risks to Americans, so long as this is a global pandemic, it will come back for us. Um. Amish, I want to go to you. I want to kind of fast forward to a moment when 
um, that feels very far at this point where we reach herd immunity either through immunizations or people getting um, COVID. Um, so something we've talked about is transitioning um, from being a pandemic. What does that look like? What does it look like where the pandemic is over and we're transitioning from this being a pandemic? Talk to us a little bit about that. So you have to remember that this is an efficiently spreading respiratory virus. It was always going to establish itself in the human population. It's got an animal host and it was going to transition to an endemicity eventually. Remember, this is part of a, a viral family that has four members, which cause about 25% of our common cold. What I think happens is we, we eventually see COVID becoming something that is much more like other respiratory viruses that we deal with year in and year out which means that there's going to be a baseline number of cases, a baseline number of hospitalizations, and a baseline number of deaths. But what you've removed is the ability for that to be widespread to a point where hospitals worry about their capacity. Similar to what we see with, with, with flu. Uh, flu is a kind of a mixed example because flu is probably much higher than it needs to be, but other respiratory viruses. And this becomes something that is part of our general risk calculation every time we step out the door. But we're safe knowing the fact that our vaccines are preventing this from spiraling out of control or causing severe illness on a widespread basis. In a couple of years, we'll likely have oral antiviral medications, kind of Tamiflu equivalents that might decrease contagiousness, get you back on your feet faster, decrease complications. And it will be something that everybody understands how to incorporate into their, into their lives. And I think that's where we're trying to aim. But what ha ends up happening is it, we're kind of in that transition point where some people are finally coming to terms with that. But some people think that the post-pandemic life is going to be 2019 and that this virus is going to magically go back into bats. That's not going to happen. And I think that's what we really have to keep emphasizing, that this is now a new normal. And our goal is to reduce the harm the virus is causing by antivirals, by uh, vaccination of high-risk individuals, and, and really teaching people how to make good risk calculations when they uh, partake in certain social interactions. Michael, off of what was just said, the idea that we have learned lessons. I'm, I'm, I cover DC in politics, so often the lessons don't feel learned at all. <laughs> um, it feels like we're just going in circles often. Um, but on the lessons that we have learned and um, the fact that you know COVID, coronavirus 19 is going to probably be just a part of you know America, have we learned enough to prevent the next one? Or have we learned enough? Do you feel confident that the American people specifically and, and members, um, people who do health policy and, and run the government, have we learned enough, enough lessons to move on from this and to, and to make sure that um, we do get to that new normal? And, and maybe even um, what would that new normal even look like if it's not 2019? Mm. Well, first of all, uh, let me just uh, challenge the assumption that we know enough now to even take care mm -hmm. of this pandemic. I think that we still have a lot of open questions, uh, most notably, as you just heard from Rachel today about the issue of booster doses in the United States and how other high income countries. Uh, there's a lot of questions about this and what it means. And we're learning a lot about this virus as we go. I hate to make the analogy, but I think we're trying to build this plane of why we're flying at 30,000 feet. So we've got a lot left to go. This virus has surprised people a number of times. Um, you know, when you ask me what the future looks like, you know, I should uh, disclose that every morning, the first thing I do when I get up is I scrape off the four inches of mud on my crystal ball and hope that I can see something, okay? <laughs> and uh, I think that that's the case with this particular infection. Um, this summer surprised a lot of people about this big surge in the U.S. Now, I, I was one of them that anticipated that we would see something like this because we still have almost 90 million Americans who could be vaccinated who are not. We have a lot of human wood out there for this forest, coronavirus forest fire to burn. Globally, the same is true. You know, I can tell you, I mean, Iran is just completing, when I say completing, they're now starting to turn down their fifth major surge since the beginning of the pandemic. And this one was the largest one and the highest number of cases reported just a week ago that they've ever had. That's uh, playing out in other areas of the world like that. So I think that we have a long ways to go yet uh, before we can say where we see the end of the train and what it's gonna look like. Um, but I think that the point is there should be lessons we're learning all along the way. And I would agree with that. That's very important. My last notion I, I would just put out, and not everyone would agree with this, but you can't prevent pandemics. 
a respiratory mm. pathogen that's going to jump is going to jump. What you can do is greatly diminish the impact of the pandemic by a very comprehensive global quick response. And uh, that means having things like vaccines made in advance, if not already being used, that could be available on a worldwide basis, et cetera. But uh, I think when we talk about the new normal, the new normal has to include the concept that this isn't the last pandemic that humans will experience. Hey, Mr. talk a little bit about um, the difference between harm reduction and in abstinence during pandemics. Because if this isn't going to, one, we're not through this pandemic. Um, my fiance, who is not an epidemiologist, but has been obsessed with epidemiology since he was a kid, very cool, I know, um, was has reminded me over and over, this is not going to be um, our final pandemic together, uh, which is terrifying to think about. But talk to about, a little bit about the harm reduction versus abstinence and how anything that we learned this time may change the way um, that public policy forms around those two concepts. So the whole concept of harm reduction comes from other parts of infectious diseases, from HIV and from sexually transmitted infections. And it's really premised on the idea that you know people are gonna take risks, maybe risks you disagree with, and you try to provide people tools to be able to make those risks a little bit safer. So like for injection drug use, you might say, uh, use clean needles or uh, have Narcan with you or have somebody with you when you're injecting or with sexually transmitted infections, you might say, wear a condom or use pre-exposure prophylaxis for HIV versus abstinence only is basically when you say, don't do this under no circumstances, do it, period, end. And what ends up happening when you do abstinence only is that you sometimes drive behaviors underground because people still take those risks, but now they don't have the benefit of having any kind of insight into how to reduce those risks. And I wonder if in certain parts of, of with COVID, a lot of that, a lot of us went to an abstinence only approach and it was very taboo to even talk about harm reduction. Now I think people are talking about harm reduction, like opening a window, wearing a mask, doing things outdoors, being around more vaccinated people. That I think was an opportunity that was lost because in places like California, for example, where you had indoor, you had outdoor dining ban, many people were still gathering in their homes, doing things that were much more risky than if they were outdoors sitting at a table. And I think that that type of thinking really created mistrust because people knew some of these things were lower risk. And then it also ended up fueling a lot of these behaviors that were driving cases. And, it, and then I think that's an opportunity that's lost. And I think the next pandemic, the next infectious disease emergency, we have to really be very clear on public health communications of what we know, what we don't know, how to reduce risk and really meet people where they are. Otherwise you start, you start getting people to, that don't want to follow any of it or, or listen to you at all. And I think that public health had a lot of trust eroded based on how politics got injected into this and this, and I think a little bit too much on the abstinence only approach versus a harm reduction approach, which basically got thrown out in the beginning of the pandemic and is only now starting to come back. Maybe just to add on to that, I think that's a terrific point. I spent most of the pandemic living in France and in France, they had much stricter lockdown rules. They had strictly enforced curfews at the height of the lockdowns. You needed a piece of paper to leave your home. And it was very interesting because people would generally speaking, obey the letter of the rules. They would not leave their house after curfew, but they'd get together for big parties during the day. And that was technically allowed. Uh, but obviously it's suboptimal in preventing transmission. I think that if you take too much of a sort of punitive, legalistic, we're gonna prohibit this thing, we're gonna ban this thing, it, it doesn't bring people along with you, it alienates them sometimes. Hmm. So that's not to say there shouldn't be any restrictions or any rules. I mean, I think mask mandates, for example, can be a very good idea. Sometimes you would need to close indoor dining and related, but I do think the sort of legalistic approach to public health is problematic sometimes because you get people coming out the other end who aren't bought into what you're doing and are looking for runarounds around the spirit of it. Rachel, you, well, I just threw my glasses, <laughs> you, you bring up a really good point there kind of about the legalistic approach. The people that are talking about the, that have been talking about this pandemic the most are people who are not doctors, they aren't epidemiologists, they're politicians, right? A lot of the information people have been getting is from those politicians. So what should we take into the new normal? Um, as some sort of people on here um, that are in college are probably gonna be the politicians of the future, how do we get um, public policy 
experts to be trusted as, as much as they used to be, right? We've lost a lot of trust in um, a lot of because of politicians, um, people losing trust in institutions, losing trust in public health experts mm -hmm. and experts in general. So what are the things that people can do to make sure that that doesn't happen or to fix that in between now um, and, this, and this kind of next wave of uh, pandemics or whatever uh, the kind of issues we end up having? Rachel. Uh, this is over Sorry. to me. No, it's okay. Um, you know, I think one thing that's happened with, well, there are many reasons that kind of the COVID response has become politicized. So I'm not going to try and say it's any individual reason. I do think, though, that experts themselves have a little bit allowed themselves to become politicized at times. Mm. Um, and I think one thing that's been unfortunate is that a lot of experts have positioned themselves more as advocates than as uh, givers of direct factual advice. And I think that there's a, a constituency of people who are already pretty bought into kind of COVID restrictions and rules who will, you know, eagerly absorb that and listen to what they have to say. But for other people who are maybe a bit more skeptical, who are more maybe in the world of harm reduction that Dr. Uh, Amish is talking about, um, it's, it turns them off, right? Because they say, well, you're not acknowledging the trade-offs. You're not, my, I want my kid to go to school. I want to see my friends. These are important things to me. Why are you, give me the facts and let me make my decision versus telling me what to do. And they feel like it's a, it's not a straight fact-based, uh, delivery, right? Now, you know, there's obviously role for public health advocacy. I'm not trying to be an absolutist about this, but I think that sort of, I think people need to regain faith in experts that they are telling them information and not advocacy. And we need to be careful not to blur the lines between those two. Mm -hmm. um, Michael, I, I wanna hear you on that question as well. Well, I think that uh, we've had a real challenge with the science of COVID in a way that has fallen victim to the politics. Um, I feel like the scientific community and getting caught between what was perceived as the previous administration's position on COVID and anything else, basically people fell down on the political side and then tried to make the science say that. I mean, you start out with a good example is where did this virus originate from? Many of us were quite convinced that there's no evidence at all that this virus originated from a man-made virus effort. But rather, we could say, we don't know, could it have been a leak out of a laboratory? Yes, it could have been. Could it have been a direct spillover from other nature? Yes, it could have been. And we don't have enough information. But I saw many of my colleagues not doing that. They automatically went, no, it's not a lab leak. It's not, you know, it, it almost in response to the political statement that had been made. I think another area that has been a real challenge has been masking. You know, for almost a year and a half, our group has been very clear on the fact that if you actually look at the effectiveness of face cloth coverings, surgical masks, N95 respirators, largely facial cloth coverings give you very little additional protection. And in fact, the data from actual organizations that the, this is their area of expertise will show you that based on the data we have, if you wear a face cloth covering, you probably get about an additional five minutes of protection in a room where the virus is at. If you wear a surgical mask, you may get 10 to 15. Now, on the other hand, if you wear an N95 respirator, even if not tight face fitted, you'll get up to two hours to 10 hours. Now, you know what? We don't ever talk about that. We talk about masking. And if you try to nuance it, you're immediately perceived as being anti-masking, which is quite the opposite. What you want mm -hmm. is effective masking. And so we, we continue this line. The same thing is true with education. Uh, I think right now we are about to unfold the worst experiment of the entire pandemic and that is putting our kids back in school. And I say that because if you look at the first uh, nine to 10 months of the pandemic, we did see very little evidence of transmission of the virus between, through and by kids. And you could concur from that, that in fact, you know, it was in a school environment could be a safe place to go. Based on that, the CDC even came up with recommendations saying it could be three feet apart, even though we know that aerosols are a very important part of the transmission of this virus. Well, along comes Alpha and Delta, and it changes everything. 
And now we're seeing widespread transmission. Uh, we saw it with Alpha here in a state like Minnesota. We're now seeing it nationwide. Look what's happened in the southern parts of the United States. Hillsborough County today, over 5,000 students out from either infection or quarantine in just the first week and a half of school. And yet, if you look at the recommendations, it shouldn't be happening because we let ourselves get caught into we want our kids back in school. I understand that as having five grandkids under the age of 11. I get that. But at the same time, when the science changed, we had to be very clear about this is what we know about the science. I'll just conclude by saying the same thing is true right now in the vaccine issues. And what does it mean? Uh, I heard from many people do not criticize the vaccines, interpreting that if you talk about the breakthroughs, you're criticizing them because then you won't get people to take them for the first time. Well, you know, again, we should be telling the truth as, as a matter of fact. And so I think that our own science has been, in a sense, captured by this political overtone where it's just unpopular or difficult or people are unwilling to tell the science truth. And I think this goes back to Rachel's point. The public just wants somebody to tell them the truth. You know, let them work it out in terms of what it means, but be truthful and, and be able to adjust. If, 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 if anything, science is a correcting process. All along, we learn, we change. From that, we learn more and we may make more changes. And so I think that if there was any lesson in this pandemic, I hope we all take home is, you know, tell the truth from a science standpoint, let the politics and policies work out their own and don't be confusing the two because in a sense you do lose credibility, people don't trust you. I hear, here. I could not endorse that enough. Um, and I will just say, you know, for all the problems that have emerged later about his tenure and COVID response, this is what people loved about Andrew Cuomo during the first bit of the uh, COVID pandemic. They felt like he was the one telling them the real story of what was happening, whether it was good or bad. Now, that doesn't mean he did a good job writ large, but he did not sugarcoat things. He got mm -hmm. up there and he said, here's what's happening. And people responded really well to them. I know it's hard when we see what we consider bad behavior from people, but sometimes you have to trust the public to actually give them the information straight and trust them to do what they can instead of trying to shape a narrative, think you know best what they need to know or what they should think about something, give them the straight truth. I'm curious what you think about this because as... It's constantly talking up to politicians and now have over the last year also talking to a lot of public health experts. Um, the, the sense that I get is that they don't trust the public, that what we have proven, what, what they feel like the, the, the American people especially have proven over the last um, year and some change is that we can't be trusted to just get the information and make um, a well-informed, well-intentioned um, well decision. Um, and that someone does have to hold the hand of that. Does that viewpoint, as your, your colleagues are saying, does that viewpoint, you know, make it more difficult for people to trust public health experts, to trust um, politicians, if this were to happen again, and in, in, as we move out of this? I think there's real damage that's been done between the public health and the public, and I think it has to do with what Dr. Osterholm and, and Rachel were saying, that, that this is about the way data is conveyed to the public, what you can say, what you can't say, and no matter what side it might be on, maybe it's really good news that you're seeing and, you, and, and it's politically incorrect to talk about that or or that, it, or it's something that's bad and you don't want to, and, and they don't want you to say it because it will be spun a different way. All of that creates a, a kind of a breach between the general public and public health. And we don't do that for any other type of infectious disease outbreak or, or, or we have not in, in normal day-to-day -day operations when you're dealing with somebody with tuberculosis or HIV, you try to empower our people and I think we got there, there are some ways where, where the politics was being very paternalistic about what public health officials could say what you could say what you couldn't say you weren't necessarily and I, I it was a lot of things that people would believe but were afraid to say publicly and, and as someone who has to do the media a lot and I, I know Dr. Osterholm does it a lot it, there was a lot you get pushback right away if you say something that's not PC or or it's not necessarily what the narrative that the administration wants, if you, either administration wants, um, and you can often see what happened, what you say be taken out of context or used for whatever political party's specific point. So during the pandemic, I, I tend to go on all three of the major cable networks equally. 
just for that point, but it's interesting to see who asks me what questions. And it's yeah. clearly being shaped by, by the politics of what's going on. So I could be on Fox saying the same topic. And I say, they, they just ask me different questions that give them the answer that they want. And, and it's very hard to, um, to, na to navigate through all of that. But I clearly, I, I think that one of the biggest failures, there's so many failures in this pandemic, but one of them is going to be this public communication yeah. and trust between public health and, and, the, and the general public. And it will come back and it will, it will bite us because it's so important during these types of infectious disease emergencies, even if they're not pandemics, for people to be able to have this ability to talk to experts and actually understand what they're saying and then, and then trust that they're saying something that's not somehow couched in some kind of politics or being sensitive to any politician. If I could just add a piece to that, I think that, that thank you, that was really a, a very, very good overview, Amy. Um, let me just give you a case in point. Over the last two weeks, uh, and particularly as it relates to school, I've been on a number of the national talk shows and Meet the Press this past Sunday, talking about masking. And, you know, when people hear me say what I just said about face cloth coverings, or they, you will use that in a line. But what I keep coming back to is safe and effective masking, maximize it. You know, what can we get the most of? If you have a car that only has a single seat belt, wear it. But on the other mm -hmm. hand, if you have a car that has a seat belt harness, collapsible air, uh, body, airbags, computer on system on board to slow you down before impact, shard glass that doesn't cut you, get that. And the point is being able to describe optimal protection. So it's not about yes or no masking, it's about please, optimal masking. Don't wear it under your nose. It becomes just a diaper chin at, for your chin at that point. Okay. And you know what? The governor of Florida has circulated widely within the state of Florida. My comment saying masks don't work. Hmm. Okay. Now it's exactly the point. You, you, you're going to have people use against you uh, some quote that's taken totally out of context and not put into the content as we want it as scientists. We have to learn to deal with that. And, and it's hard, it's very hard. And I don't think as a science community, we're really taught how to deal with the issues like this, how to communicate. The last piece I would say is, you know, I've been in this business 46 years and I can tell you the last 19 months have been unlike any of the 46 years. I've been involved with many controversial issues. Uh, I led the effort in Minnesota to be the first state in the country to make HIV reportable at a time when it was seen as a potentially very discriminatory action, et cetera. Well, in the last 18 months, you, I wish you could see the number of death threats I've received or the number of vile emails and, and so forth I get every day. That is a whole new world that we in science now have to adjust to. And we have to be sure that we don't let that shape our messages, that we don't let that hmm. change telling the truth. But it's nonetheless a real challenge that is really a first time for me in all of my public health career. And same thing with me. I get tons every day. I get called all kinds of weird combinations of swear words. And it's interesting because I get, when I'm on MSNBC, I get called something. I get called a socialist this. When I'm on Fox, I get called a Trump supporter. Yeah. When I'm on, it's, it's, it's just so that I, whatever it is, and it, sometimes I don't know if it's the same people that keep doing this to me, but you get it from all sides, which I think is good. The left comes after you, the right comes after you. That means you're probably doing it correctly. That's right. Yeah. That, I, get the, I get the same thing. You should see my Twitter DMs. They're not, not fun. Not fun. You have to learn how to know it, I guess. Um, I mean, when it comes to, to that, what I'm getting from the three of you is that the public communication aspect of this pandemic is probably the one that, or one of the ones, top ones that we have to figure out before the next whatever and in, in, in this new normal. Do you think there is enough well, one, we're not through this pandemic. <laughs> is there time for that work to be done now? Like, do you feel confident that that's something that can work? Because it doesn't, sorry to say, but it doesn't feel like our politics are going to get better anytime soon. Um, I can only imagine them getting worse. Um, so when it comes to the public communication aspect, can we <laughs> can we fix it? It's not like Bob the, Bob the Builder show. Can, is that something that we can fix? Or, 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 or does the science community, do you guys, you and your colleagues have to figure out a different way um, to get things across while, you know, not engaging in, in the politicking? I'll, I'll start with you, Rachel. Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. Uh, you know, I think first you have to admit you have a problem. And I yeah. think 
you know, the public health community as a whole is not entirely there. You know, there are some, <laughs> I, you know, I'm surprised the three of us actually all agree on this because it's certainly not, I think, a consensus uh, position at this point. Um, you know, I think we need to have accountability writ large about what happened in the COVID response and what went wrong. I think a sort of 9-11 report style uh, mm. kind of congressional inquiry could be good. I mean, I really, well, there's some have more blame than others, but there are a lot of mistakes to go around on all sides. And I do think it would be very useful to have a kind of deep dive look with, a, you know, the benefit of at least a little bit of hindsight. And I mean, going forward, there's a lot that needs to change. Part of it is technical, right? Do we have testing capacity in place? Do we have vaccine stockpiles and PPE stockpiles and just basic you know, preparedness measures in place? And some of it is more political and trust and social solidarity and cohesion. I think probably the latter is in theory the harder nut to crack, but so far we're not even making much progress on the sort of relatively easy, low hanging fruit technical stuff. So I think a lot of this can be addressed, but you actually have to make the effort to do it. And everyone right now seems to just wanna move on as quickly as possible. Could, could I offer a context to that? Cause I, I think again, we are in violent agreement here. It's a wonderful panel to be <laughs> on, I love it. Um, but you know, we don't, we, we can't miss the opportunity to do it right now to fix this. And the reason is it's all about our vaccines. We have, <laughs> so many disenfranchised, marginalized individuals who basically won't get vaccinated for whatever reason. And I can know all that I know about vaccines and public health, but if we can't communicate that and actually some change occurs in their understanding and belief, then what have we accomplished? And in many cases, that's not going to be me. You know what? Uh, look at me, look who I am. I walk in the middle of the inner city black community and start lecturing about vaccines. How wrong, how wrong that would be. And so I think that part of what we have to understand is, is we still have to do this outreach and we have to base it on the best science, but we need the people who are the experts at being able to communicate with populations that we're not familiar with. And that's not just true in the United States. We are going to have problems with, I call the last mile, the last inch with vaccines around the world. We're already seeing that. You know, getting them the last mile to the location where they're needed is very different than turning the vaccine into a vaccination with that one inch needle going in. And so I think that, again, it's a situation where science has to be politically, socially uh, acceptable for the a listener who is the one that we're trying to influence. And so, so I think we have to do this right now. We're learning a lot about how we have missed that in the past. And we've been, in a sense, I, public health has, has not been asleep at the wheel, but I don't think they understood that our messages in many cases weren't hitting the mark because we didn't understand the differences between them and us or us and them. Um, we are running one, this has been a wonderful conversation um, and we have to get to the students, but I do have really quickly a question to ask each of you because this has been <laughs> um, kind of a downer. I think all four of us giving all types of sad information, but I wonder if when you look at what the new normal can look like, each of you, you know, take just a, you know, 20 seconds to tell me a good thing that you think we have already learned that we can apply um, as we move forward into the quote unquote new normal. Um, I will start with the mention. I would think the good thing is, is that we have this tool, this vaccine, that is, that's the best thing out of this whole pandemic. And if you look at all the failures of the Trump administration, one bright spot was Operation Warp Speed and that whole concept. So moving that forward and expanding that whole idea for the next pandemic to prepare proactively, to start looking at viral families that might have pandemic pathogens within them and working on, on pre-positioning vaccines or at least doing preliminary work on vaccines, on antivirals, diagnostics, all of that is, is going to be something that we carry forward because everybody's life was touched by this pandemic. And I think we have an opportunity to get it right for the next one if we don't squander all this opportunity and the 600,000 lives that were lost. Michael, quickly. Uh, I'll just save time. I think you said it very well. I mean, you said it very, very well. I support that 100%. Rachel? 
Uh, endorse, and then I would just maybe specify the mRNA vaccines in particular. Uh, it seems like it's a platform that can be pretty easily updated, yeah. um, potentially responsive to new and emerging pathogens, and even potentially, you know, uh, for sort of the long lasting scourges of society for malaria, for example. So I think that's a bright spot uh, and certainly is something we did not have, you know, 18 months ago. See, everybody, I'm not going to send you completely depressed into your <laughs> into the rest of your week. Um, we have four amazing students here to ask some questions. Um, Jamie Snow, I'm going to go to you first. Thank you, Jean. Um, hello, my name is Jamie Snow. I will be an incoming freshman in the fall at the university, and I will be majoring in biology. My question is for Ms. Silverman. Ms. Silverman, you have studied public health, so I wish to inquire about a sociological phenomenon that relates to our current situation of public health amidst this pandemic. In June of this year, the Washington Post published an article titled, Imposing Vaccine Mandates Can Be Counterproductive. This article is about how mandates provoked negative responses in people who in turn became less willing to receive the vaccination. This response may be heightened due to the current situation of political polarization influencing the negative behavior towards vaccines. Coming from your perspective, can you explain why this happens and how do you think public health officials should approach this issue of mandate messaging? Sure. Well, I mean, I think, well, we live in a very sort of dug in world where, you know, there's a group of people who haven't been vaccinated yet and are, you know, open to it, but haven't sort of decided whether they're going to. And there's a group of people who definitively have not. And you want to be careful not to push more people into the definitively will not. And certainly mandates can do that. On the other hand, this is also to some extent an empirical question, um, what happens when mandates are imposed. And so far the evidence from Europe where they've put mandates into place to access some public services is pretty encouraging. You see these kind of surges in people signing up for vaccinations because actually it turns out a lot of the people who are not opposed uh, but just haven't gotten around to it or kind of wait and see, say, yeah, actually, I would like to go to a restaurant again. I would like to get on an airplane and it's worth it to me. So like so many things in public health and life, uh, it's about trade-offs and sort of where those sit, because you're going to push people in both directions to some extent. I think the other thing I would say is just at some point you have a question that's not just about getting more people vaccinated, but also just who you're protecting and how. Um, it could just be the case that even if it pushes some number of people to say, I definitely will not get vaccinated, the sort of net health and epi impact of, of basically creating safer spaces for the people who are vaccinated and pushing some number of additional people to get vaccinated outweighs whatever the negative effect is of pushing a few more people into the will never get vaccinated camp. So it's not an easy answer. You know, these are, it's all trade-offs. It's all sort of at the margin. I don't envy the, uh, the policymakers who are making these decisions. Um, but yeah, I'd say that's my perspective on it. Thank you. Kaylee, how about you? Thank you, Eugene. I'm an incoming freshman and I will be majoring in media and film with a concentration in production. My question is for Dr. Osterholm. In your book, Deadliest Enemy, Our War Against Killer Germs, you outline how public health systems should address infectious diseases to make sure they do not turn into a pandemic. I'm curious to know, did the US ever use any of these nine point prevention plans pre-pandemic? Did officials try to implement any of these policies post outbreak or was it just too late? Well, let's say the fact that we have the pandemic, we do, obviously they didn't get used. Um, the nine points that we covered in the book, Deadliest Enemies was one, first, uh, number one, create a Manhattan Project-like program to secure game-changing influenza vaccines and vaccinate the world. Clearly very few of us anticipated that the next pandemic would be a coronavirus, not uh, an influenza virus. But the point being is, is that the, the very thought of what we're trying to promote here is exactly what we talked about a moment ago uh, with the idea of uh, Operation Warp Speed was how do we actually make this happen? Now the challenge is, and I, because the last part of that is and vaccinate the world, uh, we're not doing that. And the reason is we don't have the infrastructure right now to do that. Uh, by the time we have the vaccine made for the world, it's gonna be several years at the earliest. And so think how that is gonna to continue to result in many, many, many cases around the world. And the concern, of course, again, variants being 
uh, an outcome of that, as well as, of course, the horrible, horrible morbidity and mortality. So at this point, we have had a general lack of understanding of the big global needs for pandemic preparedness planning or response. And I think that that's changing. And I say that because if you look at the economic impact of what this pandemic has done, uh, if you look right now, what's happening in Asia, it's just something as simple as Vietnam, which is in very, uh, di very difficult times right now with this virus, you're seeing a number of international companies who have major manufacturing capacity there that has been totally shut down and they literally are running out of their products. And so I think that the business community for the first time really understands why we have to get behind this, not just government, not just the public health community. So if I go through all of these, every one of them really has a sense of how are we going to invest for the future? This is like an insurance policy. This is not just uh, an, uh, somebody's jobs program. This is for the future. And I had a Nobel Prize laureate economist say to me uh, some months ago, look at if you have something that can make a real difference in this pandemic and it costs a billion dollars, I'll find you the money tomorrow. Why? Because it'll save trillions of dollars. So I think not only is it about uh, morbidity and mortality, but it's also about the global economy. And I would just say that a number of these priorities, I think will have consideration in the near term, just because people now realize, oh my, what if this were to happen again? Thank you. Stephen, how about you? Yeah, hi, uh, I'm Stephen. I'm an incoming, uh, actually I'm a transfer here at uh, Suffolk University of studying political science. Uh, my question is for a mesh and uh, my question is as uh, dr osterholm has pointed out the world needs to collaborate on covid 19 in order to stop it or new variants will keep popping up and it seems that vaccinating the majority of the world is the only way to end the pandemic but between vaccine hesitancy and only a few countries controlling most of the vaccines uh, this doesn't sound achievable do you think there's another way to end this pandemic while we wait for leaders to get their acts together? Or are overstressed hospitals and Zoom meetings the new normal? What kind of future are we facing? For most of the world, I think it's going to be overstressed hospitals. I don't think that we're going to see anything appreciably change. It's going to probably be well into 2022 before many of them have enough vaccine to just okay. get their high risk population. So I do think you're going to see a lot of of preventable death and, and, and hospital crisis go on all around the world because of the way uh, this has been handled and, and, the, and, and because this is gonna burn for some time. You may start to see some of those countries get enough people infected that they get some level of population immunity, but it's gonna come at a major, major cost. So I, I don't think there's any other solution other than the vaccine. That's the only sustainable solution where you don't have all the negative effects. You can't keep people, people, especially in resource poor countries, they don't have the ability to social distance. They don't have the luxury. Social distancing is a luxury when you have enough savings and food that you don't have to go out every day and do that. I think that's another lesson that needs to be learned. And I think what we'll, we'll see is probably... I wouldn't be surprised if in 2023, we're still dealing with flares of this in, in some parts of the world. It's, it's a really uh, dire situation when it comes to the globe. Uh, and I think we, we have enough of a problem in the, we have a huge problem in the Southern part of the United States. That's magnify that a lot. And then you understand what's going on globally. Thank you. And Christina. Thank you, Eugene. My name is Christina Priest. I'm an incoming freshman at Suffolk University, and I'm actually really excited to ask my question to you because I'm going to be majoring in communications. <laughs> As a White House correspondent, what do you think of the Biden administration's communication strategy compared to that of the Trump administration's strategy? I'm especially interested in their social media strategy and their ability to reach target audiences to communicate their policy goals. I'd also like to know what we can learn from the comparison of the two, especially in terms of truth and trust in government institutions. Do you think the Trump administration has changed the way social media will impact politics forever? Well, this is all very good questions. Um, I think starting from the top there, um, Biden versus Trump administration on their communication strategy. Uh, they couldn't be more different, right? Um, I'm in the White House briefing room, um, tussling with Jen Psaki, the um, press secretary, um, often, and it is a completely, it, 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 we are back to the normal 
adversarial relationship that an administration is supposed to have with the press, right? Our job has always been to hold them to account, to hold them to things that they've said before, to call out things um, that either aren't true or, or, or ask questions um, to gather more information for the American people. It is not as bad as it was during the Trump administration. We all remember the knockdown drag out fights that the press secretaries had with members of the press that the president had with members of the press. Um, and so I think the, the they are just wholly different. It, it feels, and that was one of the things, you know, I talked to Jinsaki um, off of, you know, out of the briefing room. And that was one of the things that she and the, the president and the rest of the communications and press staff really focused on was making sure that that relationship normalized. One, if people, if you're not yelling at people all the time, they're probably not gonna write terrible stories about you all the time, right? So, so they, they, there's a benefit for them for that, but they also wanted the country to feel um, like there was less happening, that uh, the way they put it all the time is that the you know, adult had taken the will again. I mean, I think that has been a lot of their, their main focus. Um, when it comes to the social media strategy, the Biden administration has been really interesting um, because they are the first administration in a very long time to come in when there's an, a national, uh, international pandemic. <laughs> like there's, and um, the, the recession because of the pandemic and all of these other humongous issues, climate change. And so like one, of, one focus of these issues um, would bring almost any administration to like their knees. And so they're having to do this all at the same time. And one of the things that, um, on their press and comm side that's been fascinating is how they are um, constantly kind of carving out niches, right? Like they know that their message doesn't work for everybody every time. And I think that is something for anyone who's in comms or, or um, even in media writ large should really think about, right? Like they tailor their message per person. They know that Joe Biden is not going to get a conservative white man from Arkansas to get the vaccine. So they don't even try, right? They have um, Francis Collins, <laughs> um, who is a who is an evangelical, talk to that ma that man, right? And so they do things like that um, that I think are really smart. I think that the um, you know Olivia Rodrigo, for those of you that are pop um, <laughs> that are younger and listen to pop music, um, was at the White House recently, and they've really started to focus on youth vaccinations, right? And so they're they've been doing this over and over and over again. I think that aspect is um, is something that everybody that works in media and co communications can take from that. Um, and your other question was, do I think the um, Trump administration has changed the way social media will impact politics forever? Yes. Um, Trump himself, not even the administration, right? Like the administration itself used um, social media kind of the normal way that administrations do, right? Like you put out a video that the president did, um, you tweet out the policy, but what happened, you know, Donald Trump, obviously, you know, we would get tweets at three o'clock in the morning. And I think something that has stuck around is, and it's not Trump is, is, is Donald Trump was not the, um, you know, he is, he is also a symptom and not really a cause of this, is the way that people interact in social media is much more hostile, right? Um, and as we, as we were talking a little bit earlier, you know, a few years ago, you could never imagine a doctor getting hate messages in the way that they do now, right? And so that has completely changed everything. Um, I used to kind of joking, like everyone's much more snarky. Um, and that's true, but also everyone's looking for something to either be mad about, they're looking for things that reinforce their own views on a lot of things. And anything that's outside of that um, is something that is wrong and you have to flip the table about. As someone who covers a Democratic administration, just like I um, covered a, a Republican administration, tough but fair, um, what's been really fascinating for me is watching people who like a year and a half ago were like, oh my God, journalists can do no wrong. You're the best, take it to them. And now that I'm taking it to their guy, now they're like, I'm a monster, I am a shill, I'm, you know, like all types of different names that I won't say on here. Um, and so I think that has changed not just social media, but American culture forever. And I think um, we don't even have kind of a, a sense of how much that changed, what that means, because that changes politics and, and even the way people interact um, with each other um, in their personal relationships. I think I answered all of those questions. Great questions to those students. Um, 
good luck. I mean, I remember when I was a student and young and my knees didn't hurt. It's a great time. Um, we have a, um, some questions from the audience that um, we have a little bit time left. And Amesh, I know you have a hard at, out at seven. So I'm going to start with you here. Um, should those of us who got the J&J &J vaccine, I am one of those people, um, be prioritized for boosters over those who got the two doses of Pfizer or Moderna? Because right now M the MNR mRNA vaccines are the only ones um, mm -hmm. that they're, they're recommending um, get a booster. So this is where I may be a little bit unorthodox in, in, in my thoughts on the vaccines. I think you first have to step back and ask, what do you want a vaccine to do? And I think what we want vaccines to do is prevent serious disease, hospitalization, and death. And by that metric, we're not seeing people who got the J&J &J vaccine or any of the vaccines be hospitalized to a great degree other than those immunosuppressed populations uh, that were initially the response to the, where they initially made a change to the primary series. So I haven't started to recommend to my patients to get a booster yet for the J&J &J vaccine because I haven't seen data to show that it's failing where it matters. If you're an immunosuppressed person, I think we're trying to figure out what the best way to go about that might be because clearly there, there was an increased risk of hospitalizations with immunosuppressed patients, people had organ transplants, but I haven't uniformly started to tell people to get that. And, and, I, and I'm a little bit, um, I, I agree with sort of the stuff Rachel said early on with, with uh, on the boosters that I don't know what the, the marginal value, if it's, if it's worth it for a fully healthy person to be getting an, a third dose or an additional dose when what you're really preventing are mild illnesses, when there's you know, a bigger problem with getting first doses into people. So I, I tend to be a little bit skeptical of the overall booster po uh, policy right now for the general public until I see more, more clinical data, not just the antibody data. Perfect, perfect. Thank you so much. And I know you have to head out. Thank you so much for your time. Um, and you know, this one, Rachel, I think I'm gonna give to you. This is taking the legalistic approach and it's um, kind of international mm -hmm. here. Um, the person says, it's my understanding Australia and New Zealand have been taken, have taken the legalistic approach and have been very effective. Is that correct? And if, if so, why? Because that New Zealand just shut down again over one COVID case, which, yeah. you know, as someone who is, you know, I'm, I don't want to get in trouble. I'm not, I'm not anti anything, um, but it was kind of su so surprising to see that happen. And, you know, when, when this is a country where, you know, it's, it's running rapid. So let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so, so far, well, if you go back two months in time, I think you can say it was working quite well. Um, you know, I think they both pursued a zero COVID strategy of basically, we are going to get cases down to zero. And then once they're down to zero, normal life except uh, international travel resumes in full. You know, and there were all these stories of them having music festivals and such. So I think... <laughs> If you can get there early enough, if you can get to zero COVID, it comes at a cost that there's some light at the end of the tunnel that you're promising your population. And so they went through these periodic lockdowns and there were very strict legal restrictions around the you know, quarantine hotels and who could travel and where. But in general, there was sort of an idea of like, okay, here's what we're trying to achieve. And once we get there, your freedom's back, basically all of it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that helped bring people along in limited periods of time when they did these sort of time limited shutdowns. It seems like it seems like maybe Australia is at the end of their road for how long that's going to work for. Um, there are huge protests against the shutdowns. Obviously, Delta is much, much more transmissible. They are in strict lockdowns and cases are still going up. And in the meantime, you have a situation where they're very under vaccinated. Um, in part because they say, oh, who needs it? Where, you know, things are good here. So it worked for a long time. Certainly, if you look at their overall deaths, they're in much, much better, you know, uh, situation than the US is. But I think even there, you're seeing some of the downsides of a super legalistic approach. But also, I mean, again, up until this point, the populations were broadly bought into it because they understood the choice the governments were facing. And now they are not so much. And they're sort of saying, what's the end game? What's the way out of this? Are we just gonna live in perpetual lockdown, isolation from the world? How, what's the next thing? New Zealand, I think it's still more or less working because they've been better able to bring the population along with them. And they've also had fewer periodic lockdowns. 
but we'll see. I mean, if this current outbreak gets out of control and then there's an extended lockdown, you know, then I think it starts to be an open question. You know, does the population start uh, rebelling at some point? In general, I think populations were pretty willing to go along with the strict legal measures for a limited period of time. But when it started to feel like this is gonna happen in perpetuity or every time X happens, that's when you lost people. Uh, and they started saying, well, you know what? It's been a long time and mm -hmm. I really wanna see my grandparents. And I really wanna have dinner with my friends. And I really wanna go to the gym again. And it, it becomes harder to bring them along if they don't see an end in sight. It feels very like a carrot and stick of right like people have to um people have to be told um that at the end of this you're going to get something right like i remember when the masking when, when as vaccinations were being rolled on the, this administration i think has done a really good job about with that people were like okay why do i have to still wear this mask when i did all the right things i've gotten vaccinated mm -hmm. which you know sped up the the move um to get masks off in indoors and now we're back to that because you know people don't listen yeah, um, I mean, and that's where my, vaccine my, mandates can be very helpful, right? I mean, because right, that is yeah. the that is the carrot that says, do this one thing, and we're going to give you much more freedom and access to the world. And actually, that allows us to give everyone more freedom and access to the world. And, you know, it's unfortunate if you choose not to be vaccinated, but that's a costly decision for society. It should also be a costly decision for you and your ability to interact with society. Michael, um this person wants to know, why don't you think kids should return to school in person? And is this for all age groups? Yeah. Well, first of all, let me just clarify. I didn't ever say that. I didn't say don't go to school in person. What I said is this is the reality of transmission. And uh, if in fact you don't have at, uh, high quality masking, you don't have vaccinated teachers, you don't have ventilation that has been reconstructed to maximize its uh, uh, improvement of the air, and if you don't have testing and follow-up quarantine, then you're gonna have an outbreak. You're gonna have a serious challenge. And so the question is, given that, uh, what do you wanna do? How do you wanna do your school? What, what, what kind of contingency plans are you gonna have uh, when in fact you have a large number like Hillsborough County, I just mentioned, I could go through a number of school districts in the South that are experiencing this today. And so that's the question. But what people all come back to is, are my kids in school or not? And that is the challenge because that's not the issue from a public health perspective. The public health perspective is, are my children in school and at risk or not? And if they are at risk, what can we do to minimize that risk? And I think that's what people are missing because it's gotten to be, it's just like the mask issue, a mask mandate in a school or not mask mandate in a school. What it's come down to is nobody's actually asking, does it make any difference? What does make a difference? You know, how can you improve on mask quality? How can you make it a much safer environment by good masking? And it's all been caught up. And this is, I think, the point that Rachel started with at the very beginning of this entire evening was the fact of this, how, how we are perceived in our messages and what people hear. And so I think that that's the challenge. So I, I'm all for school. But what are you going to do if you start to have a big outbreak? How are you going to handle it? How are you going to actually... Uh, protect yourself and your family members. Uh, and I think that's that's a huge challenge. I have a friend who has, um, you know, a, a seven-year-old daughter um, and he is, you know, he, her, she was out of school all of last year and he's not a, you know, COVID truther or anything. He was pretty cautious last year. He's <laughs> vaccinated, but he is of that attitude. Like I want my daughter in school in person and I don't want her wearing a mask. And I think, you know, if I talk to him, I think one thing that really, you know, pushes him from a messaging perspective to be more and more entrenched in that position is a feeling like the goalposts keep changing. That mm. he's, if he, he just said, if they just said, the school district said, if cases in this area are over this level, there will be masks. If they drop below this level, the masks come off. He'd be much more along for the ride versus just sort of feeling it's unpredictable. They're changing it as they go along. Now you have to change to some extent because the virus changes, right? And you know, obviously things need to be updated. But I do think we need to, instead of just sort of uh, you know, doing it on the fly, making decisions somewhat impulsively, we need to think more strategically. Okay, what are the conditions for safe schools, for what kind, what those schools will look like? 
and to some extent try to stick with them to give some sense of predictability mm -hmm. that it's evidence based that it's responsive to events versus just sort of oh we're all collectively panicking and now we're all collectively relaxing even though it's irrational too rachel um from a, from a global health perspective, and we talked a little bit about this at the beginning, um, when it comes to sharing vaccines, right? Um, can the you the president today has said that you know we've shared more vaccine than anyone else? That sometimes they they call them loans, and I'm always very confused. I'm like, are we? How are we getting that? How are we getting these vaccines back? But when we're giving these vaccines to different countries, like, is this something you see? One, I, it seems quite important. Um, and one of the ways that we're gonna get out of this is countries like the United States sharing vaccines with those um, other countries and nations. But do, can the US expedite vaccine delivery around the world? And, and more importantly, does it seem interested in that aspect? Do you think we're, we're kind of sitting on our stockpile because we're scared of what could happen next? So uh, there's multiple things going on. So yes, we are sitting on a stockpile, a big stockpile. They are currently, I saw some calculations by a colleague, uh, Josh Michaud at uh, the Kaiser Family Foundation. But basically, if you look at kind of what's forecast, what they're currently holding in stock and what's forecast to come in, in addition to the 500 million that they've said they plan to distribute abroad, there is still enough to give the entire American population a booster shot, vaccinate the entire population that is so far refused uh, vaccination and vaccinate all the kids who are not currently eligible to be vaccinated. So we are certainly sitting on quite a big stockpile. Now, you know, it's tough. To some extent, I'm sympathetic to the administration. It is their primary responsibility is to American citizens. You know, I get that and they need to be prepared for that. On the other hand, I think it is inexplicable and really upsetting that there is not more of a priority on vaccinating the entire world. And they seem to see it a little bit as charity, um, as, oh, okay, we're gonna do this nice thing for everyone else. And why aren't other people doing nice things for everyone else? Versus just sort of, this is a global imperative to get us out of this pandemic. It is a diplomatic imperative. It's not a good look for the US to be hoarding vaccines while other countries are suffering. And it's, um, it's myopic in terms of variants. And it's, you know, you, you hear sometimes, well, no one else is doing anything. Well, you know, that's a privilege and a curse of being the United States of America. Sometimes you have to be the one to step up if nobody else is doing it. So I, I find it, continu it continues to boggle my mind that this has not been more of a priority, that it seems to be a back burner thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I think um, the, uh, the discussion of Operation Warp Speed was important. Uh, you know, Trump administration had many problems, but that was a really good initiative. And part of what it was, was an industrial policy. And it was continued by the Biden administration of, we're not just going to leave this for, to the free market. We're going to work with the manufacturers. We're going to get the supply chains together. We're going to de-risk manufacturing at risk and, and pay for that so that there is oversupply. We should be paying for dramatic oversupply. We need to get ourselves out of this scarcity world where there are enough, enough vaccines to go around. It's not as simple as just snapping your fingers or allocating some money and it happens. But if you're the United States government and you're willing to allocate the commensurate resources that it deserves, it can be done. And it is truly mind boggling to me that it's not being done. Um, we have one last question before we give everyone the rest of their evening back. And Michael, this goes to you. Um, how much long COVID are we seeing in people who are vaccinated? You know, that's unclear. We're definitely mm -hmm. seeing it. The question is how much? Mm -hmm. And again, do you, want to explain, of, do you want to explain what long COVID is? Yeah, long COVID are. or long haulers. These are the individuals who may have as their initial presenting symptoms, everything from mild symptoms to severe illness. And instead of recovering it with severe illness within weeks or with mild illness within days, they actually go on and sometimes progress having other signs and symptoms that have been described in some ways, much like chronic fatigue syndrome or thereabout. Some involve basically their heart, some involve their lungs. And it's a, a condition for which we don't know exactly why it happens. It does not appear at all that it's the live virus itself, but rather the immune response that is happening from the host. But it's nonetheless a debilitating condition. Now, clearly, 
uh, there are a number of people who contract this who recover eventually, months later. Remember, we've only had, in a sense, 18 months to deal with this virus to understand what are the long-term outcomes, okay? Most of those infections have occurred within the last 12 months. So we're still learning about that, but definitely it has been seen in those who have been breakthroughs with vaccines. And uh, this is unfortunately a stay tuned moment that we'll know more about in six months. Uh, but until then, uh, you know, th this is kind of the state of the art. Thank you both so much. And Tamesh, who's gone. Um, and thank you for everyone paying attention and listening to this great conversation. Um, Christina, over to you. Thank you, Eugene. Thank you. This conversation far exceeded my expectations and actually went in ways down rabbit holes and in different <laughs> avenues than I was anticipating, which actually is great, right? I hope it has left our audience and our students with a lot of good information, clear communication, and questions, especially about how to communicate good public health, good public policy, and how we can think about how that translates into, into making good public policy and into impacting human behavior, right? So we have a long way to go. You talked about long haul, Mike. We've, we're in it for the long haul. And, yeah. and I hope we can, as Rachel talked about before, have some solidarity around it. Like, yeah. Yeah. I am typically a glass is half empty kind of girl. <laughs> and I think I think that's a, a good attitude here because you know I was not a believer in hot back summer. I didn't take off my mask. I thought all of that was was problematic and it was, right? And you really unpacked some of the huge difficulties that we have in getting people to behave in ways that we would that, that the science tells us is good for us. So how do you do that? This is the end of an amazing journey and we have a journey ahead of us. So I wanna thank not only the panel, but I wanna take a few minutes to look back at what we've accomplished over the course of these six very busy weeks. So we have had lots and lots of amazing contributors to this series who have given their time, their expertise, and their generosity to speak not only to our students about really important issues, but also to our wider, our wider public. And this is kind of what it looks like in terms of the reach of this series. We have had 72 different organizations from all over the world who have been represented in the audience. And it looks a little bit like this. We have had people from all over the world tune in. We have had questions answered from our live audience. We have had members of, lots of members of Suffolk University who have been working tirelessly behind the scenes and we have also had a great partnership with GBH and the Ford Hall Forum in order to put together what I hope has been a really informative course. With that, I will thank you specifically for the conversation tonight about real issues and about how to get to a better place. I still don't know what the new normal is, so <laughs> I'm gonna have to come back to you about that little, still a little unclear. I think you said four inches on your, of stuff on your crystal ball. <laughs> so like, can I lock you in for eight months from now? Maybe. <laughs> All right. Here. Thank you. It's, well, no, no, no. I'll take the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Out of the store. Out of the store. You signed up. All right. All right, so Eugene will will drive this along. All right, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you very much. Your evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so everyone. Much.